Hello, this is Mrs. Mary DePaul, and I am the elementary librarian at Fort Washington Elementary School in Upper Dublin School District. Today, I'm going to be sharing with the fourth and fifth graders a read aloud. This Wednesday, February 3rd, is World Read Aloud Day. So I've chosen a, a picture book, um, but it does have a um, amazing cultural and worldwide theme. And it is definitely, like I said, for, for older children. Our story today is entitled Molly Banneke. It's written by Alice McGill, and the pictures are by Chris K. Swint Piet. On the title page right here, we have two dedications from my husband, Marion McGill, and my daughter, Gwendolyn and Paulette, by AM. And with the illustrator, it says, I dedicate this book to all the teachers in the world for their tireless and compassionate efforts to educate our future. Thank you. And that's by CKS. At this time, I'd like to really thank Hewton Mifflin Company for allowing teachers and librarians like me all over the world permission to read their books. Molly Banneke. On a cold gray morning in 1863, Molly Walsh sat on a stool tugging at the udder of an obstinate cow. She was a dairy maid, and it was her duty to get up every morning around five o'clock and go to that same shed and milk that same cow. The man who owned the cow owned the cottage where she lived, the manor house, and all the land around. He was Lord. Molly kept tugging. The milk squirted into the pail. When the pail was full, it was her duty to take it up the hill to the manor house and hand it to the scullery maid, who handed it to the kitchen maid, who handed it to the cook. The jittery cow kept hooking his head. The week before, the cow had kicked over her pail of milk. The cow the cook had warned Molly that she would be brought before the court if ever again she stole his lordship's milk. That was the law. Molly's shawl was thin. Her hands were very cold, but at last the pail was full of frothy milk to the brim. Suddenly, Molly sneezed. The cow jumped, the pail tipped over, and the milk seeped into the damp ground. Before the sun set that day, Molly stood before the court. The usual punishment was death, death on the gallows, but no one who could read the Bible could be executed for stealing. So a Bible was offered to her. That too was the law. Molly's voice rang out clear and true. Her life was spared, but the justice sent, sentenced Molly to seven years of bondage to be served in a colony across the ocean. Having no family, Molly Walsh, age 17, said goodbye to England and boarded a ship. After she landed to the New World, Molly worked for a planter on the eastern shore of Maryland. There, the cannons fired at daybreak, calling the servants to work. Molly tended her master's tobacco crops, pressing the tiny brown seeds into the earth and picking the worms from the flowering stalks. 
Her calloused hands grew strong, strong enough to control a team of oxen and to hold the plow steady. In her spare time, Molly sewed and nursed the sick for pay. After working for the planter for seven years, Molly was free to go. As the law required, the farmer gave her an ox hitched to a cart, a plow, two hoes, a bag of tobacco seeds, a bag of corn seeds, and clothing and a gun. Acres and acres of fertile land stretched ahead of her. Just before sunset that same day, Molly left the road and went four miles into the wilderness where she staked her claim. That a lone woman should stake land was unheard of, but Molly's new neighbors saw the way that she jutted out her chin. They helped her build a one room cabin. They helped her harvest and cure her first crop. They helped her cart the tobacco to the warehouse to sell, but Molly soon realized that the farm was too much for her to manage alone. One day, Molly read a posted announcement that a ship would be landing soon. Because she needed help in working her land, she decided to watch the docking of this ship, a slave ship. She watched the men of Africa file by one after the other. She saw the misery, anger, and shame on their faces as they were forced to mount the auction block. Then she noticed a tall, regal man who dared to look into the eyes of every bidder. Molly brought him home and vowed to set him free after his time was up. Molly talked to this man, using her hands and arms to tell him of her homeland and of her, her years as an indentured servant. He smiled at this strange looking woman with sweet grass eyes and straw hair and skin the color of the underside of a melon. He told her his name, Banaki. Because he was not used to the climate, he was often sick with chills and fever. Still, Banneke would walk up and down the rows of tobacco, stopping to turn each leaf on a stalk as if reading a printed page. He showed Molly how to dig ditches, to guide streams of water down the furrows. As the tobacco ripened in the fields, Molly and Banneke grew to love each other. She signed his freedom papers and a traveling minister performed their marriage rites. Though Molly had broken the law, colonial law, by marrying a black man, her neighbors came to accept this marriage and to respect Banneke. In times of drought, he shared his knowledge of irrigation and crop rotation, learned at an early age in his native country. Years passed. Molly and Banneke had four young daughters, a large house and many outbuildings. It overlooked their hundreds acres of land. Suddenly, a great sadness struck the family. Banneke died and Molly was alone again. She drew her daughters closer to her and taught them how to work the land. Mm -hmm. 
Many years passed. In time, she had a grandson born of her eldest daughter, Mary, and her husband, Robert. In her Bible, Molly wrote her new grandson's name, Benjamin Banneker. She taught this young boy to read and to write. She told him about his grandfather, a prince who was the son of a king in Africa, and about her days as a dairymaid across the ocean in England. So that's the end of Molly Banneke. I am now, it's a great story. Um, it is for about, you know, fourth or fifth grades, maybe third grade. I do also want to um, share this part of the book. This is in the back part of this story. And it's just a, um, it's the, it's a nonfiction account of the history at the time. It's, it's kind of neat to hear it and know and understand what it was like. So I'm just going to be reading this. In the late 17th century, many people from England chose to leave the hunger and poverty in their country. They became servants in the American colonies where laborers were desperately needed. In exchange for sea passage, indentured servants agreed to work for seven years, after which time they were declared free. Some, such as Molly Walsh, became indentured servants when they were exiled from England by law. Molly herself escaped death on the gallows by a legal loophole. She could read the Bible, and so her life was spared. It was the responsibility of the court to supply the Bible, as many poor people did not own them. Many years later, after she became a free woman, Molly purchased a Bible from England. After a grueling two-month voyage below the decks of ships, where crowded and unsanitary conditions often led to disease, the seven-year passengers were sold to owners who were required um, to, to provide them with food, shelter, and clothing. At the end of their term, bonded servants were given all that was needed to start again on their own. Often they moved further west and staked claims. Settlers could pay for the land after their first crop was sold. African slaves had no such options. They were treated as property for the duration of their lives. Under their laws, colonists could be forced into slavery for marrying a slave, though Molly Banneker was never prosecuted for this crime. Molly also feared retribution, retribution from disapproving neighbors. Um, Banneke never converted to Christianity, and as the nearest church was in Baltimore, it is thought that a traveling minister married them privately because um, Banneke was free. Therefore, children uh, were born free. Um, their eldest daughter, Mary, also married an African slave, Robert. When Robert became a baptized Christian, the planter who owned him set him free, free to marry, free to own land, and free to come and go as he pleased. So that's Robert. Having no last name, Robert took his wife's name of Banneke. By the time their first son was born, the spelling of their name had changed to Banneker. Taught to read from his grandmother's cherished Bible, Benjamin Banneker went on to become, oh, and Benjamin Banneker was born in 1731 and he died in 1806. He went on to become a highly regarded scientist and mathematician. He taught himself astronomy and surveying and was appointed to the Federal Survey Commission that planned Washington, D.C. So that was even before Washington, as we know, it was built. Benjamin Banneker was one of the planners. Benjamin Banneker is best known for calculating epem ephemerides tables um, that use the locations of the sun, moon, and stars to measure time. From the year 1792 to 1802, he published an almanac. Um, it was the first by a black man featuring these astronomical tables as well as scientific essays. Benjamin, Benjamin Banneker wanted to disprove the popular belief at the time that blacks were inferior to whites in intelligence. 
In 1791, he wrote to the Secretary of State, Thomas Jefferson, concerning the injustice of slavery in closing one of his almanacs. Jefferson answered, agreeing with Benjamin Benneker, and sent a copy of the almanac to the Academy of Sciences in Paris. And that is the story of Benjamin Banneker. I really hope you enjoyed that story. I really did. Um, like I said, I read it almost every year to my uh, fifth grade class. This week with um, World Read Aloud Day, I am hoping that you are all um, benefiting from being read aloud to. Maybe you can read to a younger sibling and parents and families who are participating. Um, like I said, this book is a wonderful read aloud for a little bit of older children. And uh, I just want to thank you for joining in today. And remember, uh, reading aloud is a gift. It's a way to bond with um, people in your family and uh, a, wonderful a wonderful way to um, uh experience that, you know, back and forth that a read aloud creates a discussion. And this, this book is truly rich in discussion topics for the older elementary school student. So once again, thank you for listening and watching. Keep reading.